This is Binghamton Now on News Radio 1290, WNBF Binghamton, and WNBF.com. I'm Bob Joseph. Today is Wednesday, October 30th, 2024. Now is the time to call 607-772-1290. Share your opinions on Binghamton Now. Rise and shine, everybody. That wood isn't going to stack itself. And welcome to my world. Another big day. Elections underway. Everybody seems to want to vote. And who could blame them? I want to vote, but I'm exercising extreme restraint by waiting till election day. Already thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people in Broome County have uh, voted. Thanks to the miracle of early voting. And I've been receiving uh, some reports, some accounts from across our beautiful, beautiful county, the county of Bloom. And um, generally speaking, the people um, indicate the experience has been flawless. They uh, have enjoyed the pleasures that come with the ability to vote early. So... If you want to chime in, discuss your experience, if you had any um, anything unusual happen on your way to the polls, if anybody attempted to pay you to vote a certain way, I'm kidding. Nobody would do such a thing. Nobody. Nobody. So early voting continues in Broome County today. I believe the polls are open till 5 p.m., and you can vote today, tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then, nobody, nobody in Broome County will be permitted to vote on Monday. Monday is a day of rest when it comes to voting. And then Tuesday, of course, the Super Bowl of voting. The biggest election ever in the history in the history of the world. So it's uh, it's going to be fun, in my opinion. So if you have thoughts about campaigns, thoughts about the miracle of voting, wouldn't it be nice if we could vote from our phones? I hope, hope in time for 2028, for the 2028 presidential election, I hope they finally have come up with an app so we can vote using our phone. If we can get food delivered, if we can get virtually anything delivered within 20 minutes, we should be able to vote. Just come up with an app. There must be an app for that. Or there will be, hopefully in 2028. I'm sure Elon Musk is working on it, even as we speak. Morning, your caller number one. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? I'm uh, the uh, local chairman of. Uh, uh, no, I'm just John from Bingham. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was reading from my resume. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, hey, uh, how about that IM3 New York? <laughs> I mean, well, I'm still waiting for. Uh, Shalish Yupredi to call in. He has my number. He has my email address. And uh, I invite him to uh, come on the program. I, I have an open door policy when it comes to people who run gigafactories. All operators of gigafactories are allowed on the program. Well, apparently only one reporter uh, <laughs> uh, can. Uh, I talk about this resurgence, this rehiring of all these people that were fired a week ago. <laughs> I, I saw the report. I saw Jim Emke's account, and I, I have to admit, I was, uh, I was very impressed. 
That was a, a global exclusive, so uh, kudos to Jim Emke for the hard work. I still, let me just uh, punch up his story on BinghamtonHomepage.com. Battery production resumes at IM3, New York. And this is uh, indeed a global exclusive. I certainly would have been happy to speak, speak with Chantley Shepretti on the program yesterday. But, um, hey, everybody everybody decides how they want to handle their, their media. Myself, after doing the global exclusive with my good friend Jim Emke, myself, if I were Shantley Shepretti, I then I would have called Bob just to say, oh, by the way, he, he wouldn't even have to uh, give details. He could just say, by the way, I am finally speaking about what's going on here in Endicott, and you'll be able to watch tonight on News 34. And, well, and you know, the, you know because I, see, I missed it. If I knew, if I knew, actually, I did see, because Jim Hemke posted this yesterday afternoon. I wasn't able to see it actually on TV, but. Well, uh, you know, we both have great opinions, high opinions of Jim M. He's very, very good. Yeah, but you know, it comes it comes down to this: uh, what what hard questions uh, were posed, and and what did you you pretty offer as evidence uh, that uh, th- uh, you know, and and why didn't he file a war notice? I mean, well, maybe he didn't think he had to. I Let me for people who haven't. Uh, heard Jim Emke's story. I'll read from the website, BinghamtonHomePage.com. Headline, Battery Production Resumes at IM3 New York. The production line at lithium-ion battery manufacturer Imperium 3 New York is back up and running as its owners look to dispel any concern that the business is going under. The co-founder, Shaley Shapretti, met exclusively with News 34 Tuesday morning at its Endicott Manufacturing Plant on the Huron campus. Freddy said the company, which laid off much of its workforce two weeks ago, brought back some of its employees yesterday, so that would have been Monday, as it resumed production, of the only lithium battery fully designed, developed, and produced in the United States. He said the layoffs were always meant to be temporary, as IM3 New York continues to seek both new investors and the final certifications it needs to start selling its batteries to customers. You pretty read from a prepared statement, and I won't read the prepared statement, but I um, that part I find of concern. When people read from prepared statements, it suggests to me that, what can I say, John? Anybody who reads from a prepared statement, I, I mean, not that there's anything wrong with that, but prepared statements suggest to me that they've consulted attorneys and other advisors so they, they can word things precisely going well, forward. The best story, in my opinion, uh, was written by WSKG about a week ago. For those that don't really understand the history of it, I, I thought it was very in-depth and uh, followed the money, you know, because there was a... Uh, yeah, she did a good... A good overview, I think her size up of what's been going on with the Gigafactory, I, I thought that was probably the best overall local report of how we got to this place. I, I have to admit, I've done some reporting, casual reporting, the best I could, but one of the things that makes it difficult for me is Shelly Shepretti doesn't want to talk to me anymore. So... You know, I can, one can only surmise, over the years, John, we've talked about this in the past, over the years, people start off, almost everybody starts wanting or willing to answer questions from me, and then sometimes after, maybe I reach the question limit, as I did with Chuck Schumer, so after I reach my question threshold, then they they stop participating, which of course is everyone's right not to answer any more questions when they get fed up with with, well, with people trying to get information. At, at one time, you pretty was saying that there was no government money involved, and, and that was just, you know, an untruth. Uh, you know, uh, so. well, but, see, the thing that also makes this 
difficult from a, a news standpoint. I mean, a lot of people have asked over the years from the very beginning since that glorious day when Andrew Cuomo showed up in Endicott to reveal the amazing plans for a gigafactory that ultimately was supposed to employ thousands of people and uh, be churning out tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of batteries by this point. Uh, people have wondered why, including you, have wondered why local media haven't been doing a better job at covering the trials and tribulations of IM3 New York and the consortium. And it's just difficult if people don't talk to you. Now, I will say that a lot of people, a lot of people have talked to me on background, off the record. And their their fear of speaking, on, they are afraid of speaking on the record because they think there's going to be hell to pay if their name is associated with telling telling what's really been going on. So that's you know, and I'm I'm hesitant, I'm hesitant to use information from people. Not that I distrust them, but I I'm hesitant to use information about the Gigafactory. When people, understandably, don't want their name attached to it, I, I believe that many of the people I've spoken with have been, been telling pretty much uh, an a, or giving a, an accurate picture of what's going on. But I, all I really need to flesh out a, a decent story is for Shally Shupretti and Andrew Cuomo and Chuck Schumer and Harvey Stanger to come on the program, maybe all four together here in the studio, and spend three hours answering a few questions. Well, I, I think that that would be the, the proper thing for community leaders to do. But I, I can't I, I would say that this about face, this rapid about face uh, has something to do with the election being next week in which, you know, Josh Riley, the Endicott guy, is bemoaning uh, the industrial collapse around here and Donna Lopardo aired commercials walking with a hard hat uh, in uh, Upredi's uh, dream world. So I, I can't help but think that political forces say, well, <laughs> whatever you're doing, please don't do it a week before an election. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, you, as you pointed out, you observed on Monday, I guess, the full parking lot. So, and you, right. pretty much, and I, you know, here's the thing: maybe, maybe I drop the ball on this one, thanks to your observation. See, I drive by there maybe once or twice a week, but you can't, you can't be there. Timing's everything. So, you know, on Monday, it just so happened I didn't didn't go past there. I mean, the last time I went past there, there were about nine cars in the parking lot. And then you observed on Monday where it looked like um, a big gigafactory party was being held without yeah. advance warning. So, but I appreciate that. Hey, I got to run along. KSO. <laughs> yes, right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, WNBF News Hotline. Hey, you. Hi, we're on the air, so choose your words carefully. <laughs> I don't. I always. You always do, but I. Actually, no, I don't. But um, well, <laughs> I don't think anybody always does. No, no, nobody always does. I try, yeah. but you know, mm. but we're human. So anyway, I just yeah. because because John from Binghamton was just talking, and then I said, "Hey, I got to run along," and he said, "Ah, KSO." Mm. So he, John, is KSO. familiar with what we do here. Well, by this time, he should be. Right? Yes. <laughs> well, I was going to say, we're in uh, a I mean, sort of routine. So here's the thing. This is sort of, this is what we call in the radio business a tease. So coming up, coming up next, information, valuable information that will be important to you and your family. Coming up next from Karen Sweet O'Neill. That's right. And the tease about what we were going to talk about was actually yesterday. Remember? I do. Uh, of course you do. So. So couple different things, Bob. You know, it's all important Medicare season, and we're going to talk first, though, about it, it is Medicare related. It's about a data breach at WPS, and that stands for um, Wisconsin Physician Services Insurance Corporation. And why is that a big deal for New Yorkers or Pennsylvania 
or what have you. Well, the, the fact of the matter is that this is a company that issues Medicare cards and benefit, Medicare beneficiary identifiers for CMS. Okay. All right, hold that thought. Mm-hmm. Hold that thought. So coming up, coming up on this station, a WNBF exclusive is that true? WNBF exclusive, right? You're not doing this with anybody else today. No, of course not. Okay. A WNBF exclusive with Karen Sweet O'Neill. As I often say, don't touch that dial. You'll want to hear what Karen has to say coming up next right here on WNBF. Providing you with the best solutions of your lifetime. The KSO Insurance Weekly Spotlight with Karen Sweet O'Neill. On News Radio 1290, WNBF. The following segment is sponsored by KSO Insurance Solutions. Good morning, Karen. Good morning again, Bob. And what are we talking about? The information America needs to succeed. I'll tell you what. It's for people that are on Medicare because the uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, referred to generally as CMS, are issuing new Medicare cards and Medicare beneficiary identifiers, so that's your Medicare number, and to approximately 1 million beneficiaries across the U.S. So that's not a, uh, you know, a huge percentage based on how many are on Medicare, but if it happens to you, you're going to want to know, is this a scam? Is this legitimate? What is this about? Well, what it's basically about is that there was a breach, of course, of data with uh, WPS, and WPS contracts with many um, CMS providers. And in that breach, of course, there were Medicare numbers that were um, identified. So it's many different uh, states in the country. Um, They're not listing New York as one, but they're not not listing them or Pennsylvania as one. And so when people, if you get a letter from CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And within that letter, they tell you about a breach that happened in a company um, in Wisconsin. Don't think it's a scam because it is legitimate. But here's my question. So, okay, there's a kid. We'll just say an imaginary kid named Billy listening right now. He should be in school. He's eight years old, but he's listening for some reason to the best radio program in America. And Mm -hmm. he's saying... Let me see. So people are expecting these letters informing them of a real scam. So what I'm going to do is come up with a real scam and then use that language in my scam letter. So what's to prevent, like Billy, eight years old, lives over on the south side in the good section, and um, he comes up with a real scam using the language that you're discussing now. What's to prevent Billy from defrauding our listeners? Well, Billy would have to be pretty smart, little Billy. He is. He's very smart. He would have to know everything that's on their original Medicare card. Which he'll get. He'll get from his grandma. Yeah, from his grandma. That would be her Medicare card. (laughs) Grandma. Grandma. (laughs) Grandma might get scared, but I don't think the general public on this one. Right. Well, I'm just, again, you see, (laughs) see, I think scammers, and especially these youngsters, the ones who are only 8 or 10 years old, they're brilliant. And I, I just worry that, you know, they might be listening instead of being in school and learning about how to use a slide rule. Um, they uh, right. instead are taking copious notes about new scams they can perpetrate on me. I'm telling you, the scams are pretty sophisticated out there. That's for sure. I'm not in disagreement with that. But for this one, I think it'd be pretty difficult to fool a Medicare beneficiary. All right. All right. I'll take you wor- your word for it. Well, never say never, but at least <laughs> open the mail and and know that you need to use that card, you know, in the future because that is your new number. So if you go to the hospital or you go to the doctor's office or the pharmacy or where have you, whenever you have to show it, you're going to need to use that new card with the new number. Now they're going to give a leeway on a time for you to be able to do that change. Um, but it's just something to pay attention to. And people are so suspect, and rightfully so, just as you mentioned, you know, with little Billy. And, uh, you know, the thing is, is, this is coming from Centers 
for Medicare and Medicaid services, CMS. So if it's not coming from there, then you know it's not from CMS. Now, the other thing that we want to be um, you know, very, very diligent and aware um, with our uh, potential clients and just our listeners is that with these changes that are going on with these prescription drug programs and these Medicare Advantage plans, the only way that these plans can contact you is to, you know, send you a mailer. And in the mail is what you're going to see if your plan is being discontinued, if it's being consolidated into another plan with another number, or if it's basically just not going to be there in the future. And guess what? There's a lot of that going on right now. So we're seeing consolidation of prescription drug plans. So when you go to look at your plan and say, can I keep it? Your number isn't even on there. So it's, it's like, well, is it available? What's it called now? You need to open your annual notice of change and make sure that you understand that information. If you don't, just give a call and we'll interpret it for you. And also, if your plan's going away, well, you don't have any choice. You have to get another plan. So that's, again, you need to take action during this October 15th and December 7th time period. Um, with a plan that is being discontinued, you actually have till the end of the year. But you know what? Why do that? Why not just get it done now and then you'll be all set? Also, IBM retirees with the Pro um, United Healthcare uh, Medicare Advantage Group Plan, there's two different ones, Essential and Enhanced. We aren't seeing major changes with those plans. That's a good, good news bulletin right there because if you like your plan, you don't need to do anything. You just keep, it just automatically renews. So that's a good thing. Also, um, Lockheed Martin, BAE, you know, some uh, expenditures that you're allowed, subsidies. Once you get on to Medicare, make sure you take advantage of those. And, of course, NYSEG as well. And I still call it NYSEG. Yes, I do. <laughs> but anyway, um, so there's a lot going on in the industry, and it's just around the corner when the deadline is. So make sure that you talk to your agent or your broker or you call us, whatever you want to do, because you want to make sure that what you get in the future is going to be good for you for the year 2025. We are at 1708 Vestal Parkway East, up above Plato's Closet and Style Encore. You can reach us several ways for an appointment. You can simply give us a call at uh, 607 772 You can Google us at KSO Insurance. All our contact information comes up, including our website, and you can make an appointment that way. Or if you missed the phone number, we have a big display ad under insurance in the yellow pages. All right. By the way, it was just called my attention, that eight-year-old kid over on the south side in the nice part there, mm -hmm. the south side, those really nice homes. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, it's not Billy. It, it's little Willie. So it's, um, so I got, so anybody. Yeah, that's it, a song. It, it, what? That's a song, isn't it? I don't know. Stay tuned. Oh, come on now. Stay tuned. You'll, you'll be playing that. So I'm, I, I don't want to let any rats out of the bag, but <laughs> I'm just saying, Little Willie, sitting <laughs> That's there. A funny song, too. <laughs> yeah, it's a good song. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be funny if that's coming up? Wouldn't that be? Wouldn't it? You know, life is funny that way. Well, it is. <laughs> hey. <laughs> anyway, always a pleasure. By the way, in case you hadn't heard, the um, Halloween forecast is going to be the hottest Halloween in the history of, I of the world. I'm so excited. Oh, I my mean, the gosh. The kids don't have to put coats on over their costumes. I know. It's going to be great. It's great for the kids and for their parents and grandparents and guardians. Even uh -huh. the cops. Even the cops told me. I was talking to some cops, and they said even they are looking forward to a nice, mild Halloween night because that means kids will behave. The only time that they misbehave is when it's really nasty. <laughs> I don't think that's true. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's true I think either. there'll be more kids out. Well, there will sure. be. I'll be so out. Stock up on the candy. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you'll go get the candy. I know you. Well, that too. That too. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to get the convenient 30-pound bag of peanut butter cups. 
you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, you never know from one year to the next. I mean, this year, because of the weather, you probably do need to stock up on more because, you know, kids will probably start at 4 p.m. And because the weather tomorrow night is going to be nice, they probably won't be done until midnight. They're probably going to do eight full hours of trick-or-treating just to stock up for the winter. Right. And then the parents get to... That's Stockholm right. As, well. <laughs> they, they, as they say, there always are some advantages to being a parent around Halloween. This is true. Oh, you have to oh, oh. And then it's ho, 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 time to buy stuff. <laughs> In fact, it's time to buy stuff now because, yeah. you know, it's the holiday season. Anyway, Karen, always a pleasure. Have a great day. You too, Bob. Thanks. And the preceding segment was sponsored by KSO Insurance Solutions on WNBF. 607-772-1290. Bob Joseph having more fun on the radio than usually is allowed by the Federal Communications Commission. I think we got a waiver allowing us to have fun. Fun, fun, fun. Fun for everyone on WNBF. Fun radio. Give us a call. Talk on Binghamton now. Online at WNBF.com. On air at 92. 1 FM, 1290.0 AM. And follow us, stay connected using the free WNBF app. Now the forecast for those needing from the National Weather Service, mostly sunny today, high 74. Cloudy tonight, low 53, partly sunny. Tomorrow, high 76. Mostly sunny Friday with showers likely early in the day. Oh, good, because... I heard a guy say we need the rain, I-65. Right now, it's 52 in downtown Binghamton. Here at News Radio, WNBF, that is 11 Celsius. 11. And uh, AQI Air Quality Index is good, 49. 945 WNBF. Take a look at our website for interesting articles. I have to say, they really outdo themselves there at WNBF.com, including that uh, that story with some of the pictures down at the the um, cogeneration plant there that used to be run by Anatech, and then was unsuccessfully operated by Wellhead Electric of California, that one over at 22 Charles Street. Take a look at the article and marvel at the future. The future of manufacturing right here in Binghamton. You can see the future. If you look at that article, the uh, former Cogen plant, the Binghamton power plant, the ill-fated facility near Clinton Street is being turned into a manufacturing hub. It's 946. Good morning, WNBF. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? My name's Daniel. I'm calling from Harpersville, and it looks like blue skies. Blue skies, baby, and the living is easy. Yeah, blue skies reminds me of the infantry blue cord that the U.S. Army infantry carries. They wear a blue cord on their shoulders, so if they ever get shot, they hope to be shot charging at the enemy, so they land on their back and die looking at the sky. Hopefully none of our boys are dying, but that's one of the old tales of the U.S. infantry blue cord. All right. Well, I, see, yeah. I, I learned something this morning. That's why I come in every day, because I never know what I'm going to learn. So what else is on your mind? So, well, what else is on my mind is um, I was doing a little history reading, and the U.S. 1st Army Regiment in 1785, 700 volunteers were sent to chase illegal immigrants out of America after the, the British had lost. We wanted to make sure there was no you know, criminals in the mix. So I thought that was neat, too. That is neat. Did yeah, they ever use the military uh, against any um, people, you know, U.S. citizens well, who uh, with whom they disagreed? Did they ever tell, like, the National Guard or the military to go after their political foes? Or, for that matter, journalists? But, um ideology remember the japanese were round up and all of them thought were spies after world war ii i think right 
Yeah, that's a that's a real sorry chapter in U.S. history. It's it's shameful. Never, never yeah. again. I say, never again. It's embarrassing, right? It's shameful. But, uh, I yeah, think, I mean, it's yeah. it's almost as embarrassing as the New York State headquarters of the Ku Klux Klan was here in Binghamton about a century ago. It's it's terrible that that's part of our history. Yeah, um, but you know, sometimes my wife says you have to go through darkness to realize the light that you have. I think that's a beautiful saying. So sometimes yeah, well, our I, I guess. Lessons. Well, hopefully, hopefully we'll have no <laughs> no more of that darkness and. We'll just experience uh, light and joy going forward. Light yeah. and joy. The yeah. wide world of joy. It's no longer just a dish detergent. <laughs> uh, so one more thing about the infantry. North Carolina, that Hurricane Helena, I think its name was, that hit and did some devastation. The um, U.S. Infantry 101st Division is um, up there helping everybody out. They got deployed. They went and sent their mortar teams to uh, go survey the area. They used it as like a training mission and a, and a mission mission, right? But um, they sent the infantry up there to go shovel some homes out and fix some porches and install plumbing and stuff. So just our good old boys that bleed green. There's never any racism in the U.S. Army um, that I ever saw. We all look at each other as bleeding green. So God bless America. Love you, Bob. Hey, Have thank you day. so much. Say hi to my friends in Harpersville. Thank you. Thank you. It's 9.50. My friend Art. Or as they say on an automated station, 10 before the hour. It's, or on bad automated stations, instead of saying WNBF, 10 before the hour, on bad automated stations would sound more like WNBF, 10 before the hour, W. Of course, that was the bad old days before they perfected AI. <laughs> Let's see what else is going on at WNBF.com. I mentioned about the Giga Factory there in the First Ward, so it'll be nice to see something going on there after all these years. It's a shame. Shame to see that beautiful cogen plant sitting there idle. Like Billy, you remember um, back in the day, back in the good old days when Wellhead was running that thing? And their, their secret idea to trying to make money off that wasn't to run the generating plant year-round to provide delicious, nutritious energy for all of us as we needed it, say people in Binghamton, to get delicious, nutritious, affordable electricity. No, their idea was to run it just a few days a year only when they could make the most money, usually in the winter, when electricity prices spiked. That's why it was called a spiker plant. So their, their clever approach was to run it maybe, oh, I don't know, seven or 10 days a year to sell <laughs> electricity to desperate, desperate people, people in desperate need, and then not run it for the other 350 days a year. And they told me after they shut it down, they said, yeah, we wound up losing millions on that. It's 952 WNBF. Good morning. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? How you doing, Bob? Never better. Having, having the time of my life. Oh, well, that's good. Yeah, I was... Uh, I oh, was by the way, for it's, a for, it's a formality, but um, the requirements state that you have to give your first name and, and where you're calling from. Beverly from the town of Dickinson. All right, it's logged in. Thank you. Continue. Yeah, I uh, I found out. I was looking through some things, and I found out that that I wrote a couple of poems, and that I didn't even remember that I had. Really? And they, they were written in uh, 1995, and and when my daughter was youngest daughter was here, we found them. I said, holy cow. I said, I didn't know that. Really? Well, well, that's, uh, that's something to be treasured. Yeah. The, uh, Jerry said, I, I said publish it, but I, that, that takes money. 
Well, that's true. A lot of people go that route, self-publishing, but uh, you're right. It's it, it can be costly. So I don't know where, you know, maybe you could go out and get a loan. Uh, not at my age. Well, true. So I, I guess maybe, you know, what I would do is get the um, get the poems, you know, typed up or, or whatever, formatted nicely. Um, how many poems are there? I have three of them that All I right. wrote. I didn't even know I had them. All right. So have somebody who's good with uh, computer programs uh, get them typed up and nicely formatted. And, and print off a few copies yourself. I mean, you don't have to sell them, but you could give give out a few copies to people, you know, your relatives or friends. Yeah, it, one was about hope. Well, now more than ever. You know, if you, I'll tell you what, if you were able to print up um, 20 copies of, of a poem about hope and... Um, be out here in downtown Binghamton a week from today on Wednesday, November 6th. There are going to be a lot of people who want want to be reassured and want to know about hope after uh, after the election. Yeah, because, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that have happened out there in the world, you know. And, you know, I think maybe some people would like to read it. All right. Well... I think that's a that's a good idea. I'm glad I'm glad that you found them, and certainly is is good to be able to bring back those memories. Yeah, and uh, I I wrote a I wrote a I wrote a story about about my father when he grew up and what my grandfather was and great grandfather and so forth. And I. Uh, I gave I gave some to the family, you know, but everybody everybody liked it. Well, that was very thoughtful of you. Well, I appreciate your sharing the uh, the latest. I hope you have a great day. You too. Thank you, Beverly. It's nine fifty five here at News Radio WNBF, the station that provides you the opportunity to speak to a potential global audience of billions, as long as they have a phone and access to the free WNBF app. It's just that simple. More calls coming up. I'm Bob Joseph. You're listening to Binghamton Now. WNBF 92.1 FM, 1290 AM, online at WNBF.com. And we are joined now by a candidate for Broome County Legislature. Matt White joins us live. Good morning, Mr. White. Good morning, Bob. How are you doing today? I am well. Very, very good. And um, weather is beautiful. It looks looks like it's going to continue to be good for the next several days as the early voting continues. And, of course, people look forward to Election Day next Tuesday. Tell our listeners a, a bit about yourself. You are running in what is the 7th District, and people... Um, may not be familiar of what the 7th District covers for uh, uh, purposes of the Broome County Legislature. Tell us about the the area that uh, is encompassed by District 7. Sure. So District 7 is all of the town of Maine and the Little Italy section of Endicott. And uh, if you read my website, Matt White, for broom.com or if you've been fortunate enough to get one of my palm cards it says in huge print big ideas and the drive to get them done and that's what i do uh, i'm part of the luma projection festival i'm part of the speedy fest i'm part of binghamton pond fest i serve on a handful of boards uh, i'm the guy who gets stuff done yeah and are you affiliated with a party well you know on a local level we got to talk about issues like out in Maine, we have to talk about this tech park and how they're going to use eminent domain to take people's land to build this thing. Right, but what line are you running on? I'm currently registered on the Democrat line. Okay. That's what I wanted to know because, mm -hmm. which I knew, but I, I, I noted with interest on, on your website, as far as I can see, at least from the, from the homepage on the website, there's no, 
no mention of your party affiliation. So I just wanted to, because in case people, sure. uh, and it's not that yeah. people can't figure it out. The, the current the current um, seventh district legislator is Republican Matthew Pasquale. So, and I I haven't talked to him lately, but I'm I'm sure I'm sure he's excited about the the impending battle of the mats. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and again, it, 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 yeah. It, it, you know, uh, yes, I'm registered on the Democrat right. line, but I have support from a whole boatload of Republicans. All the Democrat, or excuse me, all the Republicans on the town of Maine board have endorsed me. Um, uh, you know, I'm. You know, people want bipartisan. That's me. I okay. Have yeah. So I, no, I, I just wanted to. So, in case people were looking for a particular line, so they say. Let's see, there are sure. two Matthews here. Hmm, I'm, I'm somehow yeah. confused. When I went yes. to vote, actually, uh, it just happens to be that my name uh, is the first line. Yes, Democrats are, are on, on the first line, I believe, across New York State. So uh, people will, will notice that in the 7th District. And by the way, you mentioned right before we came on the air, you uh, did uh, take advantage of early voting. You voted at the uh, George F. Johnson Memorial Library in Endicott yesterday? That's correct. Yeah, and we've been told by multiple sources, including the election commissioner uh, Dan Reynolds on on Monday, a lot of people are showing up at the early voting places in Broome County this year. Yes, when I went, there was a line of you know thirty, forty people, uh, and you know the line did move relatively quickly. It only took maybe ten minutes, uh, but yeah, uh, Sunday. I think the line was out the door when I tried to go vote then. Uh, and then when I went last night, there was a, a line. Uh, it's just amazing to see so many people participating in democracy. You know, if you want to be a free country, that's voting. So yeah. everybody needs to get out and vote. I encourage people to participate. I've always said, if you choose not to vote, well, that's also a vote too. But... Yes, yeah. you know and, that's that's uh, a decision. Totally. Inaction is still is still ultimate ultimately an action. Even even say if you think, well, regardless of whatever office, whether it's local, state, or national, it's well, neither candidate is perfect. Well, you're probably never going to find a perfect candidate, but at least I encourage people to always participate. Absolutely, you know there was a graphic I saw that showed uh, if did not vote was a person did not vote would actually be president right now. Yeah, and what a, what a sad, sad state of affairs. We'd be run by AI, an AI program, I guess, if, if did not vote <laughs> yeah. was, was the winner. So let's talk a little bit more about your background. What, what do you do? What's your day job? So I currently work for myself in business development. I help businesses cut their costs and improve their efficiency. Before that, I worked for about a decade uh, at a local IT firm. All right. Uh, helping, you know, all out of businesses across the county, you know, keep their printer running, be able to fix their email, you know, just general IT stuff. And also managing a lot of projects. We helped a lot of clients move to new offices. Uh, so we had to coordinate all their the different vendors, the electrical and the plumbing and, and you know, the contractors uh, and just schedule all that kind of stuff. So I'm looking at your website. Did you design the website? I did. Okay, so I like the design, but one concern I have, because one of the top issues, as, as you know, especially for the people in the town of Maine and, and for some people in part of the town of Union, is this proposed tech park uh, it, it, not far from the greater Binghamton Airport. And as you say on the homepage of the web, website, tech parks in general can be a good thing, but this one has some severe flaws. And then, unfortunately, when I click on where I stand, it... it takes me to page not found so i just want to uh, find out from you what are some of the concerns that you as a uh, prospective county legislature legislator have about the tech park that has been proposed and that a lot of people in both uh, the towns of maine and union have been um, uh, discussing over the last several months well, first of all, thanks for letting me know about the website. You know, <laughs> yeah, I didn't, today, I, I, I didn't, I uh, didn't have to say that that part live on the air, but I was interested mainly in in sure. Uh, sure. Um, segueing to to this important yeah, issue. Yeah. So the, the 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 big issue with that tech park is eminent domain. Uh, when the t when the IDA sent the letter to the landowners offering to buy it, they there was a sentence in there that says we feel this is a fair offer. And we prefer to negotiate with you directly rather than execute our statutory powers. 
they were asked at a webinar, uh, I think that was the August webinar, uh, you know, about the use of eminent domain. And, and she gave an answer that was sort of just, you know, very vague uh, and, and sort of skirting around the question. So they're going to use eminent domain to take people's land. That's already, you know, everybody knows this. And, you know, that's the big issue. And I talked to some of the landowners, and they don't – it's not just that they don't want the park. It's that they don't want their land taken from them. I talked to somebody, and he said, I'll be the fifth – my son will be the fifth generation in our family to own this land. It's not a question of price. They simply do not want to sell it. And we've heard from uh, a fair number of people on this program who are, are concerned about the project generally and also about the process, some specific aspects of it, including the, the uh, likelihood that eminent domain ultimately would be employed as, as we go further. What are the other um, key issues as you see it for the 7th district in in the county that uh, includes uh, part of the town of Maine and or is it all of the town of Maine now it is all of Maine okay it's yes that, into okay. multiple districts uh, and there was a lawsuit uh, because you can't split small towns yeah because at one point law. the plan was to split the town into three separate districts right Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm uh, glad that was rectified. So all the town of Maine and, mm -hmm. as you say, um, part of the north side of Endicott, the Little Italy section, what are some of the other issues that you think are most important to people who live in the 7th District? So I've been going door to door and, and asking people, you know, what do you want the county to do for you? Uh, and, and the big issue that I get in Endicott is water. You know, it's and it's been going on for so long that people are so used to it. They don't even, some of them, when I ask them, they don't even think of water because they're just so used to, I go to the store and I buy safe drinking water and I don't cook with, you know, with, with the, the tap water. Uh, so we've got to get some County resources coming this way to clean up the water. Uh, Assemblywoman Lepardo and, and Senator Leah Webb have been working hard and they've gotten millions in grant funding to go towards uh, a larger budget uh, that others have worked on to, you know, put a new filter in at the rainy well and to build an additional well in the village. Uh, then the next step of that is going to be we have to replace all the pipes that are in the ground that have been there, you know, just forever. Yeah, well, at least there has been some progress with that new well. It, it just seems like the development of the new well for the Endicott water supply has been a slow motion process. And I understand that's complicated, but it's still, I, I, I feel for the people who rely on the Endicott water system and, and wish that it could be moving much more quickly. Yeah, unfortunately, things never happen at the speed we want them to, uh, you know, but that's kind of one of my strengths is getting stuff done. Uh, when I worked in IT, I did a project for a hospital and they had to deploy new monitors and, and, uh, uh, memory into com people's computers and all this new software and they thought they had about three months worth of work. I finished the entire project in three days. So you're able to do some things quickly? I, I mean that's the the main thing and whether it's a water project or anything else it just seems no matter what you're trying to accomplish around here it, it seems like it takes five or ten times longer, longer than it ought to. Any other specific issues that you'd like to uh, just touch on uh, for uh, people who haven't voted yet in the 7th District? Well, I'm also working on bringing some events to Endicott. Um, the church on McKinley Ave was recently sold to a gentleman, and he really is committed to making it more of an event space. And, uh, you know, I've had some ideas with him. We were actually working on a big Halloween bash. Unfortunately, uh, the sale of the property couldn't happen in time for that to occur. But uh, I have some other ideas that I'm going to present to him. And I want to create events in the town to bring people here and let them see Endicott. And also to bring their money here and, and support the local businesses. All right. By the way, you uh, running for office for the first time. Had you considered running for any office previously before this year? Well, you know, I kind of had this feeling in the back of my mind that someday I would end up running for something. Uh, but I got multiple calls this year to ask for this specific office. And, uh, and 
And I said, okay, maybe this is the time to jump in. And also I was asked by one of the Republicans in the town of Maine board who is retiring this year to take his seat when he retired. And so I kind of weighed out the two of those and I said, you know, maybe I think I can do more as county legislature to help people uh, here in the county. Because I don't think of, you know, just Endicott or just Maine. I kind of picture it as Broome County. You know, all ships rise on the same tide. So helping Luma, even though it's in Binghamton, helps other towns around us. Helping Speedy Fest builds up other towns. Matt White running for the Broome County Legislature to represent the 7th District. Thanks for being with us on Binghamton Now. Keep me posted. Thanks, Bob. Get outside and enjoy the sun today. I will. I will. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. It's 1023 WNBF. We call the program Binghamton Now. We talk about Binghamton and beyond. 607-772-1290 is our number. Go ahead. Make that call. Speak about the issues on Binghamton Now. More calls, more often. Paul from West Windsor, you're on the air. Hello, Bob. I, I try to think of something as worthy of your excellent radio show to say. And what I thought of is uh, in the next two days, especially Halloween Eve, there's going to be a lot of excitement. And I haven't seen on TV... Uh, the Broome County Sheriff and the cop police warning people uh, to be careful. The unexpected is what happens. These kids looking for a delicious piece of candy will run across the street, and maybe five will go across, and one little one will come across later. And if people aren't being careful, I don't want to have any sad things happen for Halloween. So in your most excellent voice, maybe over the next... 32 hours, maybe you could warn people about driving carefully and expect... Oh, yeah, and watch out for uh, people with guns. <laughs> right. But uh, these kids, they get so excited about getting the next piece of candy, they're going to run in front of your car. All right. These young, these young drivers, they're not used to this. I, I agree. Yeah, so maybe in your most excellent voice, you can warn them the next couple days. All right. That's a good idea. I appreciate your well, call. Have the, have the, have the Broome County Sheriff uh, call in or the Endicott Police call in and warn people. Well, I think I think it'd be nice to have uh, Sheriff Fred Akshar on the program in the studio to talk about that. Excellent. Thank you, Bob. Thank have you. Have a good day. It's 10.30 at WNBF. Ron from Binghamton. Good morning. Good morning, Bob. Say... I would like to, with your permission, uh, make a few points uh, regarding perspective on the Second Amendment. Uh, yesterday, Mar Martin called. Uh, he used a word when he called, uh, a, re a really good word. He used the word prescient. And prescient is defined as having knowledge or insight of events before they happen. Now, Bob, the Second Amendment was ratified in 1791. What could the men who ratified it in 1791 have foreseen would be the ramifications for society in 2024? If, if the framers were referring beyond an armed militia, that is, to private citizens, could they have foreseen a person with an AK-47 spraying bullets into the bodies of kindergartners at school? Uh, for, for perspective, uh, for perspective, consider this. Bob, in 1791, toilet paper wasn't part of societal culture. Toilet paper wasn't invented until 1857, and indoor plumbing was decades in the future for the men who ratified the Second Amendment. Here's the takeaway, Bob. The Second Amendment was ratified by men who could not see beyond the outhouse. Wow, I hadn't thought of it that way. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, you put it that uh, way, that puts it in a whole new light. I hope so. I hope so. Uh, we were expecting people in 1791 who, um, I, you know, I'm not going to get into scatological stuff here, but, uh, you know, are um, still in a culture which is in, in many ways primitive. Yeah. And uh, and uh, in that primitive culture, we expect that these forefathers who some people look upon as absolute geniuses. And I don't take away from the genius of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. I think they're wonderful. But that doesn't mean they're infallible. The framers of the Constitution were not infallible. And perspective wise, again, they weren't prescient enough to see 2024. I mean, it, that, that, that's like us uh, uh, seeing ourselves on Mars, uh, living in a house. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's beyond them. It, it's 250 years or 20, 30 years beyond them. Uh, it's still an outhouse culture. And uh, the, the forefathers were not infallible. Uh, If they had been able to see someone spraying bullets from an AK-47, I think they say, well, we didn't mean that, Uh, rather than uh, enshrining that Second Amendment to the point where it cannot be touched, that it is like a papal bull, uh, an encyclical. Uh, The Second Amendment was not an encyclical. And uh, it uh, should be, um, it, it should be rescinded. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, and uh, it's, it's uh, funny, but it <laughs> has a point. Um, my brother down in uh, Florida has a cap he wears. And the cap on the front says, repeal the Second Amendment. Um, he uh, went into a supermarket down in Florida wearing that hat and uh, standing in line for some service. uh, Behind him came someone wearing a MAGA hat. And um, there were some um, words exchanged that didn't get into armed conflict because my brother's a peaceful man. Uh, But uh, I, I think we have to have perspective on uh, the people and the culture they were in and what they could foretell when that Second Amendment was ratified. It was referring really to armed militia, not to private citizens who can do what they do with guns in 2024. Uh, I'll allude to uh, something that happened, what it was, two, three, uh, how many years ago at Topps Market in Buffalo, from someone from our area. Yeah, who uh, bought his um, weapon over on Nanticoke Avenue in Endicott's famed Union District. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the uh, framers of the Constitution were, were not infallible. They did not, they did not um, present us with uh, an encyclical or a papal bull. Uh, and uh, so that, that, that's all I wanted to okay. get out. Well, I appreciate that. That's uh, some food for thought. Thank you very much, Ron. It's 1036. More calls. More often on Binghamton now, let's go to the town of Maine, Airport Road. Bob, you're on the air. Hey, good morning, Bob. How's everything? Great. Everything is great. Never better. I've never seen a more delightful late October morning. Well, listen, I'm not a real political guy. You know that I, uh, I'm passionate about taking stands on different subjects. And, you know, I've been a pain in the butt for a few people over the last two years on this technology park. And I've met a lot of great people going to public meetings in both the town of Union and the town of Maine. And I've made a lot of connections and um, people, you know, they trust me when I say something and they know I don't make up lies or make up stories. And I want to, I want to comment on Matt White. Um, Matt White has been very active in the town of Maine for a number of years. He was on the planning board, um, 
we had someone on the main board quit this summer and uh, Matt stepped up and moved from the planning board to the town board so that we had a full board for any situation that came up on the tech part. Um, I know Matt uh, fairly well and uh, respect him and uh, I'm definitely going to vote for him and recommend people pay attention to Matt. He's, he's, if he doesn't make uh, his name in this election, you'll see him again in the future. Um, he's a go-getter. Um, I will say something about his running is, is the person he's running against, uh, Mr. Pasquale. Um, we, we've reached out to him. I've reached out to him. Town of Maine board members have reached out to him over the last two years to show up and give us some advice or some help at the Broome County level. And uh, Mr. Pasquale's comment back to the Town of Maine and to, uh, to myself personally was that he didn't represent the town of Maine. Well, this guy has been sitting in that chair since 2008. I think it's time that uh, the people take a look, look at the record, um, take a chance on a new guy. Um, I really, like I said, we need to start making some changes. Too many people have been sitting in their chairs for a long time and nothing gets done. Um, I'm just, Again, Wait, you're telling me the guy on the legislature whose district includes the town of Maine said he didn't represent represent yep, the town yep. of Maine? Yep, yep. You can uh, you can look it up. It's in the minutes of the town of Maine. Hmm. Um, it's actually uh, reprinted on a Facebook page. Uh, uh, Matt White's the the, the Dayton of the oh, town. Oh, okay. Maine. I didn't uh, I didn't look at that. By the way, in fairness to Matthew Pasquale, he's, he's welcome to come on the program, too, you know, if he wants to talk okay. about representing the 7th District. Um, well, like I said, he, Ernie Palmer, who's the town main uh, board member for a long time, who's retiring this year, he reached out to him personally in emails, and um, that was the response that was sent back to mm. um, town Well, Bay it says on the, the county website, on his page, on the Broome County website, it says the district includes... Of the north and portions of the south and southeast sides of the village of Endicott, along with parts of the towns of Maine and Union. So that's well, what it yeah, says no, on his I website. Think, I think his website hasn't been updated. Because yeah, I do remember. No, I know. I think, it, uh, it looks looks like it might be in need of um, a refresh, maybe. Well, maybe that's why we need to refresh who's sitting in that seat. So anybody that's met me over the year, anybody that knows how passionate I am about my town and um, trying to keep our neighborhood and rural residential and take a, take a leap of faith on, um, on my, uh, opinion of Matt White and stick up for a guy that looks like he's on the way moving upwards. Um, all right. Well, I appreciate the, uh, the call and keep me posted. If you see, have they started any construction yet over or site prep work on the tech park? Um, no, they can't do anything until the seeker is completed. All right. Um, well, it's, uh, just keep me informed because what I've seen, and I'm not saying it would happen in this case, but what I have seen with some stories that I've covered over the last few years is sometimes preliminary work gets done even before there's been an, an official announcement. Now, I don't think they would do that with such a high profile project, but keep an eye on that because sometimes, sometimes stuff gets going before the going gets stuff. So if um, if you see something, give me give me a tip because I'll send some units out there to to at least do some I, surveillance. Well we'll unmark units. That. I appreciate that offer because um, you and um, Jim and I was gonna Roy, say Jim Emke and I will if necessary we'll coordinate. We'll we'll take turns. You, you know, I'll you, I, I'll I'll do the overnight shift and, and Jim can be on Jim could be on from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and I'll take the 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., and then we can keep a close watch. Jim Emke, we'll call it Operation Stealthy Tech. Well, my, the neighbor who has received the eminent domain letter has 32 cameras up in the woods, and he's All a right. deer hunter. So I, I'm guessing that nobody's going to want to be in the woods <laughs> in the next couple of months. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks, thanks for Bob. thanks for your call. I appreciate it. Thanks, Bob. It's 1042 at WFBF. I know Jim Emke is shaking his head. What? what are you talking about? Don't commit me to one of your wacky ideas. <laughs>
But Jim, it's only 12 hours a day for the next couple of years. It's daytime. You could anchor the News 34 from over. You could do a live shot. I'm kidding, of course. Or am I? 607-772-1290. Stand by, America. More calls are coming up on Binghamton Now. It's 1045. Now is the time for all good listeners to punch in these numbers. 607-772-1290. And uh, give me a call. Give me a call. I, I need to talk to someone. Sylvette from Binghamton. Good morning. You're on the air. Good morning. How are you? I'm well. How are you today? Well, I'm okay, except I'm not getting no place right now because um, I, I have to, uh, uh, I just <clears throat> called to see how you were, but you were always a very nice person to talk to. But I know that you're very busy and you're very involved at, you know, seeing people probably, and I, so I've been talking to Glenn Pitcher for a while, but I hadn't seen him. I went over to Wise, so I thought I'd give somebody else intelligent a call because I need to talk to intelligent people because where I live, it, I, I suffer terribly from that isolation. I get to talk to people that are very picky and harassive and, and, and don't consider themselves, you know, equal or any, that kind of thing. And Binghamton, I don't know. But this president, what do you think of Kamala? Do we, would you like her to be president? Sure. Sure. I, I mean, we, we had Don Trump. You know, so we know what he's capable capable of. He had his four years. Now I think that Kamala Harris, she seems she seems as though she is um, imminently qualified for the job. She has uh, new ideas, fresh ideas. Uh, Don Trump, you know, he he had his shot. He had four big years, and some people liked what happened, and um, and some people also didn't like what happened. Also, when he lost in, in 2020. A lot of people were um, very disappointed that he, instead of um, conceding, as uh, all of his predecessors used to do, and attending the inauguration, he, uh, he basically had a big speech for his fans on January 6th, and then you know what happened after that. Mm -hmm. So there's my concern. I mean, on January 6th, Kamala Harris didn't call on her supporters to, you know, come to Washington and, you know, try to block the certification of the vote. So Kamala Harris, maybe, maybe secretly, maybe secretly, she had concerns about the way the election results went, but she didn't say anything that encouraged people to, to come to Washington and trespass in the nation's capital. Well, I think that, that Kamala Harris, um, you know, is a far leftist. It's not really quite. Well, I, I, see, I don't, I don't judge people based on their no. perceived political, mm -hmm. like where they stand on the spectrum. If they're uh, leftist or rightist or wrongist or conservative or liberal or progressive or moderate, I just look at how they behave themselves. And my concern going forward, I want someone who's going to behave as presidents are supposed to behave in the next four years. So I'm, I'm not saying that Donald Trump can't behave as a president because we know how he behaved when he was president four years ago. So we, we, we yeah, we definitely, we definitely saw what he can do as president. I know. Uh, and, and Biden is still along with Kamala, you know, and we didn't uh, a good number of us didn't want Biden in office well, anymore. Well, a lot of people I voted for him. Biden. Well, a lot of people voted for Biden because he's the the Scranton kid, and they they liked liked his stories, whether or not they were true. So, um, you know, as far as Kamala Harris, she seems like she has young ideas, new ideas, refreshing okay. ideas, and it seems like she would bring a, a certain degree of of joy over the next four years. And isn't that one of the things we're lacking? Yeah, they're struggling too much. The people are also isolated in everything, and Governor Hochul is not putting her, seeming like she's putting her piggy bank two cents, two cents in anymore. I mean, um, she's another one concerned with these issues of legalizing psychedelic drugs, but what about our economy? 
our economy is suffering terribly. I don't. I know. Think I know. Go- Governor Hochul doesn't doesn't seem to understand what the people in in Binghamton or Endicott or Johnson City are going through. When's the last time? No, you know, the last time Kathy Hochul was here in Binghamton, did she stop here at the radio station to take your calls and answer your questions? No. Instead, she went to the weed store half a block away for a photo op to encourage New Yorkers to buy more weed. Oh. So and, and, and by the way, I have nothing against the, the people who are running that, that business. It's a legal business, and, and I, 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 I wish them all the success in the world. I'm just saying we learned a little something about Kathy Hochul about her priorities that day when instead of coming to this studio because she was here she was on court street she was about oh i would say about 74 steps away from where i am and instead of stopping by the studio to answer your questions on the program she went over to the weed store to pose with with weed legal weed (laughs) trying to trying to get more people to buy weed and again it's now legal in new york so you know i don't participate and it's legal but she showed on that one day with that one action what she thinks about you. Yeah, I wouldn't want to know. Well, you know, <laughs> it, hey, it speaks volumes. I appreciate your call. I hope you have a good day. Well, I'm, I need money for my bones, like uh, my jaws and, 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 and bone problems. I, I have health insurance. Good health insurance is not, they, they won't take anything to help me. Oh so I've been asking Glenn, and Glenn said he's going to help me, but I All have right. to. Well, hang in there. Hang in there. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for calling. It's 1051 WNBF, the station that cares. Station that cares. I, and by the way, I don't endorse anyone. I'm just saying she asked about a particular candidate. I'm just saying the way these two people are acting, that's what it comes down to. Who do you want to be subjected to every day, every hour, every minute for the next four years? Somebody who will bring joy and peace and tranquility and words of reassurance. I mean, think about it. It's a very, very important choice that faces America right now. Peace and harmony and tranquility and civility. Good morning, Dave from Vestal. You're on the air. And don't forget baloney. Because I just heard a bunch of it. I love baloney. <laughs> I love that, you know, <laughs> that Oscar, Oscar, whatever, Oscar or something baloney. And remember the kid used to sing about that baloney, the baloney song. The baloney song. There was a Maybe it was a hot dog. Song. I don't know. Who knows? No, it's I, Oscar Mayer Wiener. Didn't no. they, uh, you know, that company that sells all the, uh, the, delicious meats, the delicious and nutritious meat products, they ought to have a bologna mobile and that it could follow it, it, it just like the truth dog. It could follow the, the candidate. <laughs> or the neck. <laughs> yeah. The anyway, so what's my, on what's on your mind? Or the neck can sing my bologna. We can do that too. Hey, um, well, I wanted to comment real quick. This isn't why I call, but hats, when we were hats with, uh, uh, political statements, Bob, we expect. I, matter of fact, I expect and, and rather hope. When I wear my MAGA hat, I, I expect comments or ruffling feathers or confrontations. I hope for them. I mean, that's why I wear it. I'm making a statement. You disagree with me? Say something. I don't mind. I don't mind somebody getting in my face. I think it's fun. Anyways, Bob, hey, what, I, I have a bone to pick. I listen to the national news. I listen to your news. Everyone jumped all over that comedian. Where is the news? Why aren't you talking anything about our sitting president, sitting president of the United States, calling Trump supporters garbage, Bob? Why isn't that being? A, I want to hear it all over the place, starting with you. Oh, Why what? What? What did he say? He said yesterday, why Kamala was giving, what Harris was giving a speech, he came out and he said that he, he made a comment about the the comedian making that comment. He he says the, the garbage. The only thing the garbage is, are the Trump supporters. He said that you, there's a video of it, Bob, and no one's talking about it. It should be all over the airwaves. We're garbage. 
It's, it's like a, a Hillary saying the basket of deplorables. It's the same thing, Bob. So you know what? If we're garbage, and you know what? In this country, what they've done the past four years, if we're garbage, as a matter of fact, they're letting in garbage, Bob. It's become one big dump. Garbage is coming in left and right, rapists, murderers, terrorists, uh, fentanyl. We are, we become one big dumping ground. So I, I guess we're all going to be garbage pretty soon, Bob. If we elect them, we're going to continue with more garbage floating into the country. It's just how it's going to be. It's going to be that way. Well, but yeah, you didn't see that statement, Bob? You well, of course that? I did. I was playing the devil's advocate. I wanted to hear how you personally would describe it. Of course. I'm plugged oh. in. I'm the most plugged in person in this room. I got my headphones plugged in. I, I know what goes on. The only garbage I see floating out there is his supporters. His, his, his demonization of is unconscionable, and it's un-American. That was the president of the United States, the Scranton kid, the, the kid who went up toe-to-toe -to -toe against Corn Pop. <laughs> I know, Bob. Bob. Real quick before I go, some, you know, I stay on top. Of, uh, I do a lot of reading, and I, I, I always think I'm pretty informed. I listen to you a lot. That helps. But, Bob, I don't know if you knew this. I was reading about that, that Brian Kohlberger there. Kohlberg, is that his name, out there in Idaho, uh, accused of killing those students? Bob, and I could not believe what I read, that if he's convicted, he can face a firing squad. I, I did not know, and then I read up on it. There is like a handful, there's like three or four states, Bob, that you can be sentenced death to death by firing squad. I did not know that. I thought... I well, thought, I thought the only state that still did that was Utah. No, Bob, and I did was they do it in that. Idaho? Idaho, yeah, I was huh. reading about it. All right. They, 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 well, yeah. that sounds like my own personal Idaho. I'm against it, but... Uh, all I can say about that is it figures. I appreciate your call. Coming up, we have more calls right here on Binghamton Now. This is Bob Joseph. We'll be on for another hour on this Wednesday morning. Good morning. I'm Bob Joseph, your host, 607-772-1290. You know, just when you think you've got everything figured out, then something happens and you are left to ask yourself, the musical question, wow, Bob, wow. I mean, seriously, or upside down, you'd go, mom, Bob, mom. But that makes even less sense. Wow, Bob, wow. You know, something, sometimes you say to yourself, I can't be surprised anymore. And then suddenly I show up for work and I'm surprised. So, All right, WNBF.com, I would say, is, is a place to, as they say, Stay tuned to WNBF and WNBF.com for all the scintillating developments. Yikes. Uh, what I just found out, I would classify as an October surprise, but I can't, I can't go any further at the moment. But wow, Bob, wow. <sighs> Hold on here. Let me collect my thought. Okay, I'm ready. Let's go to the phones. Good morning. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Tom from Mendel. How are you doing today, Bob? Oh, good. Good. How are you? Good. I, you know, I just kind of want to jump back to yesterday's show. Like, I, I was, I was, I was just at awe and and just very shameful. You know, like you bring up the name calling. Joe Biden just calls all Trump supporters garbage, but you know, it is what it is. You know, the Democrats, the liberal media, they've been calling Trump supporters or anybody that even like likes Trump or wants to support Trump. All kinds of names for the last eight years. The media every day, the Democrats every day. You have Kamala Harris calling Trump supporters fascists, Hitler, Nazis, racists. Like, but that, but all the, all that name calling from like Kamala and, and the liberal media, like, that's all okay. Like, you're not even against that. And, and I think, I think as supporters of voters, just in general, they've, they've been listening to this name calling for eight years. 
and the left is crying about the name calling and turn around and name call. Like you have one caller, Mr. V, we'll call him, that says, oh, he hates speech. He's a hater and hates speech. And he turns right back around in the same breath and starts talking hate. Well, listen to the latest. Here's this just in. And this is just in from, from the D.C. Bureau. This is um, a response to what happened yesterday with the guy from Scranton. This is uh, in from our, our bureau. Well, I don't even know if it's the D.C. Bureau. It says um, this was recorded when Kamala Harris was on her way to North Carolina. And she said, and this is what Kamala Harris, the Democratic candidate, actually claimed just minutes ago. She said she's running to be a president for all Americans. First of all, he clarified his comments, but let me be clear, I strongly disagree with any criticism of people based on who they vote for. Well, I think that's really clear. She said she strongly disagrees with any criticism of people based on who they vote for. Bob, she calls the voters, and, and I don't even know how many campaigns, pretty much every campaign, a fascist, Hitler. I, I, and then the names just go on and on. And, and she's a party of hope and reunite. Well, it's, no, reunite? it's a party of joy. <laughs> it's joy. And what we need okay. more of is joy. How How is calling people Hitler, fascist, racist, narc... All those names that her, the liberal media, and let's talk about Kamala. How is that joy? Explain it to me because I'm lost. How is that joy? They, you know, the other, the other thing I really want to get out to you, it's funny how she talks about how Trump is going to sit in the White House if he wins, and he's going to try to figure out how to, you know, go after all his predecessors and lock them up. Haven't they been doing that for the last eight years? They've locked up everybody that was around Trump, even including Trump, and, and they're worried about him locking them up now. Make that make well, sense. Yes, they're worried. Because basically he has said that. He, he, he threatens to use the National Guard and maybe the military against his opponents. So what does that mean? Isn't that what they did? Wait. For the last wait, eight years? Wait, wait. Ten wrongs don't make a right. So you're saying... Oh. So oh, you're saying... Oh. No, so you're saying that you're good. You're good with with Donald Trump, President Trump, starting January 20th, using the National Guard and maybe the military against his opponents. You're saying you endorsed that. Did you endorse them doing that starting on uh, the election of 2016? Because that's what they did. They didn't say that didn't they were going to do it. it. Donald Trump has said, he said in an interview, I don't know, well, I, I, yeah, I think it was on the, the Fox. It was on the Fox with Maria Bartiromo where he, he made it crystal clear during an interview that he plans to use the National Guard and the military against the bad people on the left. Now, I'm paraphrasing. That's not the direct quote, but that was the upshot that he said he would use the National Guard and the military against his fellow Americans. He said it. The Democrats did it. When? When have the Democrats used the National Guard and the military against their opponents? When haven't they? The FBI. When? They, they were no. Everybody the, the Democrats oh point out to me, Bob Joseph on the radio, when the Democrats used the National Guard and the military against their opponents. When? Where? How? Why? So tell me and the viewers that they didn't lock up Trump and start all that in 2000. Trump hasn't been locked up. He'll never be locked up. Even though he's been convicted of 34 felony counts, the guy won't be locked up for one millisecond, and you know it. Bob, and you know that they've used the FBI, the CIA, the judges, all far-left judges, to, to do what he's doing. That's why people that are involved in those cases are leaving. They're out. They don't want no more part of it because they know it was a lie. 
They knew the dossier was a lie, that they started the Russian investigation. That's insurrection itself. If they could have made that happen the way they wanted to, they would have overturned the 2016 election then. And the Democrats had not stopped. And let me tell you something, Bob. If it was me, you, or anybody else that that went through what Trump went through for, by what the Democrats did to him and all the people around him, they would seek revenge too. You know it, I know it. And the funny thing is the Democrats think that Trump should just sit around and take all these arrows that are slaying at him and his family and not say a word, while the other half can just sit there, run their mouths, run him in the ground, run his family in the ground, and drag him in and out of court, call him a racist, a fascist, Hitler. Like, and, and you expect the man to just sit there with a smile on his face? And no, face he face? never has. He never will. No, he's, he's incorrigible, unstoppable. He, he will never be stopped, ever, ever, as long as he has one breath left in his body. He is going to fight, baby, fight. Would you do it? Would you sit around and take it? It's not going to happen to me. I can't, I can't give you an answer to such a, a bizarre hypothetical because I am not going to be convicted of 34 felony counts. I am I not going to be the subject of so many sordid accusations. It will not happen not with me because I lead a different type of life. Bob, people call, your callers on the show will say something negative to you and you snap and hang up on them. So when they react, you react. That's no different than Trump. You know it. I know it. You lie to your, your viewers. You lie constantly. You always say, oh, yeah, look at January 6th. What about the 2020 riots? How long did that last? How many cities were smashed, looted, buildings set on fire, cop cars set on fire, federal buildings set on fire, police stations set on fire? That's your voters right there. That's your Democratic voters. And that lady yesterday that was so worried and concerned, listen, if the Democrats lose, you're going to see 2020 riots all over again. You watch. If the Republican uh, Republicans lose, you're liable to see violence, too. Look at January 6, 2021 mm -hmm. for Exhibit A of what angry Republicans will do when they can't accept the outcome of an election. Well, look what the Democrats did in like the outcome of the election in 2016. They start a they start a a coup that they know was fake all the way up the line. The dossier was fake. The judges knew it was fake. Look at Comey, Strutt, and Tage. Remember they had plan two to get Trump out? They didn't even arrest them. Look look at the documents. Hillary Clinton swept under the rug. Joe Biden, oh, he's too, he's too fragile to stand trial, Le swept under the rug. Trump, we're going after him. We're going after him. Like, how do you not see that? Bob, get it together. Seriously, get it together. Stop lying to your viewers. I don't lie. On the radio. Bob, you I don't Bob, lie on the radio. Bob, you lie. You mislead and you lie. And I don't know how your handlers let you get away with it. You mislead people. Tell the damn truth. That's what a real journalist is. That's why journalism's dead. A real journalist tells you both sides whether you like it or not. That's the truth, Bob. You lie. You're no different than the mainstream media. You're a joke. You lie. I don't even know how you're still on the show, Bob. Just be truthful. You can do it. You know you can. You keep bringing up January 6th on every situation, but you never bring up the 2020 riots. I remember when I tried but to... But January 6th was the insurrection. Please. So was in 2016. Please, Dave. So was in 2016. You don't talk about that? It's an insurrection. There, there, no. No, that was not an insurrection. Okay. The insurrection was oh. January 6th, 2021. I, I have video to prove it. Yeah, well, we have evidence to prove that 
the election of 2016 was the insurrection. You don't have video to, to show me the insurrection. There, there was not an insurrection after the 2016 election. No, but there's court documents proving that the dossier was completely made up and they knew it right from the beginning. And still no one gets arrested. Weird, right? No one gets arrested in the 2020 riots. No one gets arrested when the whole Hamas was defacing statues, the Liberty Bell, colleges. Nobody, nobody gets arrested. Weird how that works. Only conservative protesting gets arrested, but not the Democratic I mean, the Democrats let 2020 go for how long? Yeah, well, 2020, there were arrests when when there were mm. uprisings in American cities in 2020. People were arrested. So never forget, never forget that people, when people are violent, when they break laws, they're subject to arrest. It happened in 2020, and it happened on January 6, 2021, when people behaved in a manner so shameful that even now it's very difficult for most Americans to look back on that tragic day, the day of shame, when so many of our fellow Americans ran amok in the capital of this beautiful nation. It's 1125 at WNBF. Good morning. You're on the air. What's your first name? Where are you calling from? Hello, Bob. It's Bob from Fort Dickinson. Hey, good morning. How, how are things on the radio? Well, good. That's why I called, actually. I uh, wanted to share some important and, I think, exciting news with you and your listeners, if you don't mind. Yeah, tell me. Tell me what's the latest. Well, the latest is where, of course, Andy and I have a radio show on WHRW, I think you know, 90.5 on the FM dial, 6 o'clock on Wednesdays this semester. That's the uh, Binghamton University radio station. And I'm pleased to say that tonight, a little after 6, we're going to have a special guest call in that's uh, nationally known, uh, very important subject matter and very uh, interesting topics. The, the uh, guest is Amy Wax. Professor Wax is a law professor at uh, Penn, and she is the first, I think, uh, instructor, professor level instructor at a major U.S. university that's been sanctioned in the way that she has. She's uh, Penn has uh, cut her pay in half for 2025 and uh, suspended her. Uh, she's not teaching. She won't be teaching in 2025. That uh, half pay amounts to about a half a million dollars, and she's also permanently prohibited from collecting any summer pay, which is a significant portion of professor's compensation as well. Professor Wax is outspoken. Anybody can Google her to see what's going on. Uh, she's a very strong uh, proponent of Western civilization and Western values, and she's been pilloried for it. Uh, this is an ongoing uh, sale against a sale against her for two years. Um, so she's going to come on our show tonight and speak to us for probably 45 minutes, and we're going to hear her side of it. And uh, I'm just grateful to her for giving us the time uh, but in a small market. You called this situation to my attention. You sent me um, some information on Sunday that it was a possibility that this interview wasn't going to be allowed on the student-run radio station at Binghamton University. So what happened there? Well, that's still a possibility, Bob, as you know. it's Yeah, it's that's what I'm curious about because you, you yeah. shared an email from the general right. manager of the Mighty H, WHRW, and, uh, and I'll read it because I think this is a matter of public interest. She uh, no, sent uh, the note to you and your co-host. I am sure you are aware that per our Constitution, this is a station committed to providing the community with educational public affairs program. This commitment includes all members of the community, regardless of ethnicity or other minority background. Given the harmful nature of Amy Wax's statements, which have led to the sanctioning of her at, um, in Pennsylvania, I'm concerned this interview may not only fail to be educational, but may potentially harm our listening community. So in order to go forward with the interview, uh, the general manager said, you must provide both me 
and someone else uh, with a transcript of the questions that you're going to ask Amy Wax as well as a written statement explaining how you will ensure the interview does not result in the airing of harmful statements and language. So how was that resolved? Did you send her the list of questions that you plan to ask Amy Wax? Well, we complied uh, as best that we could. As I, I actually complied twice, and it was a back and forth. The first, the first was to say, "Listen, this is radio; it's free flowing. I get the thing started just like you do, and who knows where these things range? I mean, it's public record as to what's happened. I wanted to, you know, I'll say to her, hey, how's how's your health? How are you feeling? Are you how are you holding up under this kind of pressure? Can you tell us?" Uh, the latest? Can you share with us your feelings on this? And so on. So I tried that approach. They said, no, that's not specific enough. And they doubled down and even required more. So I finally consulted with Professor Wax. And between the two of us, we uh, compiled a a response that also reminded the university that as a public uh, institution, they're bound by the First Amendment of the Constitution, unlike private universities, and that uh, Certainly having Professor Wax on and speaking about this thing, these things is uh, certainly not harmful, but but enlightening and educational. And, but I, uh, I get the sense, and again, I haven't spoken with the general manager. I'd love to speak with her because I actually I know uh, people who have served in key roles at, at WHRW over the years. And, you know, it's first, I'm I'm glad that Binghamton University has that station, a student-run station. I think it's important for uh, the university and for the community. But, I totally agree. And and I, you know, so I respect everybody involved. Uh, and again, I, I haven't spoken with the current general manager or anybody who's currently in the leadership positions at the station. I know it can be challenging. I Trust me, I've had conversations with people who've, who've been, uh, you know, and because... The university community, of course, is is so diverse, and it, I, I mean, with thousands, tens of thousands of people, part of the whole university community on and off campus, you want to be sensitive and beware of of anything that might cause concern among your constituents. So I understand to a degree where she's coming from, and but it it seems like this the communications from her seem to suggest that she's worried that that people can't handle something that might be said by someone who is controversial i mean it's it's on the public record and it's not new or a secret we we can read all about the background of amy wax online so yes she is a controversial person But it doesn't seem to me that a single interview on the campus radio station could adversely affect the health and well-being of of anybody who might listen to it. Well, I agree with you 100 percent, Bob. And we like I said, we responded as best we could uh, without, uh, you know, going to what we thought was too far. But let me ask you this simple question. If if a similar uh, act of uh, mandatory compliance was pushed on you and your show, how would you respond? Well, I wouldn't be happy about it. I'm not sure exactly how I'd respond because it hasn't happened and I hope it doesn't happen. Um, and But if, say, it happens that they knew that I was planning to interview someone who has uh, a rich history of, of controversy and they wanted me to provide questions in advance or maybe even cancel the interview. I, I wouldn't be happy, but I can't say for sure how exactly how I would deal with it. If I would talk about it publicly, I, I don't know. I mean, it would be, I would have to consider every every element, including my um, fervent desire to continue hosting the program. You know, I, I will, I don't intend, say if, if, there was going to be a controversial guest and then they they said oh we we understand somebody told us or maybe even i gave them a heads up you know there's going to be somebody on like say uh 10 years ago donald trump was on the program and even in 2014 he was a person of some controversy but i didn't give them much heads up because i didn't have much heads up that donald trump was going to be on the program 
talking about at the time possibly running for governor of New York. I didn't I found out, I think, about five minutes before Donald Trump called in that we were going to talk to him on the air. So you'd say if if we had set that up in advance and the people who were running the place at the time said, well, Donald Trump, you know, he he's a controversial person and some people might be unhappy or be upset to hear him on your program. So could you submit all your questions in advance? I wouldn't like it, but what would I do? Would I uh, talk about it on the air or would I try to, um, you know, discuss it, you know, to allay any concern? I'm not really sure. I mean, I, this, this circumstance here with the student run radio station is new to me. I'm not saying it's never happened before, but I believe it's the first time that I have been made aware of something like this. I'm sure in the half century plus history of WHRW, there may may have been situations like this. And it's, yeah, I don't know. It's, well, I, 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 here's my hope. I hope, I hope the interview takes place, is scheduled. And I hope the general manager and all the other people who will be listening intently to the interview I, I hope that, you know, they understand that information shouldn't hurt people. But also, and you know, as a host, you have to you have to have some guardrails. I mean, radio, even a student run radio station, I mean, the license is held by the university. So say if something goes totally off the rails, the university ultimately is on the hook. So well, we know that. Yeah. Bob, and we well, and, know and that's no that's of, of there's no history of Professor Wax going in that direction. Certainly, we right. have no history of doing well, that. Well, and that, um, you know, but I can, but I also respect the general concerns of the general manager as she laid them out. You know, and it's no secret. It's no secret that we're living in challenging times in society generally and specifically at universities. And I, I think, you know, given some of the things that have transpired both at Binghamton University and elsewhere over the last couple of years, I think, I think she probably is smart to, to be fully aware and concerned about possible ramifications because, you know, it's not, um, it's not necessarily what the intent is with an interview. You can't predict how people might react to any thing on the media on radio or tv or online these days i mean sometimes just given the the nature especially now with social media that something that used to be perceived as fairly innocuous could take on a life of its own well it's unprecedented really for a radio host to be sanctioned in such a way that you're demanded of a list of questions well i don't that's I don't know for sure that it's unprecedented. I, I mean, I doubt that it's unprecedented. I, I bet I bet somewhere in the history of WHRW wow. there's been something like this. We may not be aware of it, but just because I know I mean, there have been... In general sense, yeah. you know, well, and again, not how things go. Yeah, um, no, I, clearly an effort to censor the thing and shut it down. Well... Um, I hope that doesn't happen. We're well, I hope it doesn't. You know, do I, I want... You know, I support the free flow of information on um, on all media platforms. But I also, and, and again, as people understand with this program, and some people don't like it when I, I rein some callers in, and, and some callers have now just, you know, uh, opted out of the process because they don't like the restrictions that I as the host of the program, a uh, place on, on certain topics or calls. But I, I have to do what I think is in the best interest of the program, the community, and, and of course, WNBF Radio and Town Square Media. We're, we're, trying, we're trying to yep. always, always approach things with fairness, but also to be very judicious because, as I've pointed out before, Radio, whether it's commercial or non-commercial radio, is not the same as the Internet. Well, don't forget, Bob, in this particular case, we don't engineer our own show just to get in the weeds a little bit. We've got an engineer with a dump button 
who's got a 15, 18 second delay. So, well, and there's another know, thing that, too. So, that, you know, technically totally within their control that I don't have any control well, over that. He sits in another room. Yeah. So, you know, technically. Well, and ultimately, uh, to, to be sure, there are some hosts who've been on commercial stations in the past who actually have had long delays on their program, even longer than 30 seconds, because they've had a history of, of saying or doing things that were problematic. And, and so in the end, especially in the U.S. when it comes to broadcast stations, you, you do have to be, you have to be very, very careful very careful because even if it's not with intent if something does happen and ultimately questions or complaints uh come in from a broadcast then ultimately the fcc could get involved and there could be some repercussions even if you didn't intend that appreciate the call and uh, we'll see how things go that's a fascinating topic but um, yeah, I, I mean, look, at at every broadcast station in the U.S., that everybody has to be aware that, yes, you serve the community, and, of course, you also are serving, say, on commercial radio, the interest of sponsors. Everything has to be taken into account. Now, some people want a, a totally freewheeling, wild and crazy program where they can say about any, just about anything at just about any time, and it just isn't going to happen. Even that guy who was at the, uh, the rally, the Madison Square Garden rally, the radio guy, you know who I'm talking about. If you saw the, the highlights or the lowlights of the rally... That guy had better watch out because he's a controversial guy in New York City and New York City radio. But his performance at the Madison Square, Ga uh, Madison Square Garden rally on Sunday was so over the top and so off the rails. Some people, even radio professionals, are calling for him to be knocked off the air, even though what he said wasn't on his radio show. But that performance, that performance really actually didn't help Donald Trump because the whole, the whole point of the rally, I thought, was to try to get more voters in the final days of the campaign, more people to support Donald Trump, the people who were so far undecided. And then you get this run-up to the program with people dropping F-bombs and S-bombs and insulting fellow Americans. No, I think in the end, that guy on the radio who thinks he's everything on New York City radio and some of the other people who spoke before Donald Trump spoke at MSG, I think they helped lose votes for their candidate. 1142. This is Bob Joseph on WNBF. Let's go back to the phones. Carol in Johnson City, you're on the air. Oh, good morning, Bob. Uh, so uh, I want uh, to give kudos to Dave from Vestal for keeping on top of things. And uh, also the other fellow, I didn't catch his name, but I recognize his voice, the one from Port Dickinson who was really giving it to you. Uh, this is my uh, question or statement, however you want to take it. So... What, who was president and wasn't that military, that Kent State incident where a student was shot by a military person? Milhouse was Nixon. It was Milhouse Nixon. I was, was going to say Nixon. I, I, yeah, it was 1970. It was what, a, what, a, what a tragedy. So what branch of the service was that? Was that National Guard and aren't they considered military? Well, I thought it was Kent State or Ohio National Guard, I think. And it wasn't well, done at it wasn't done at the behest of Milhouse Nixon. It was, I think it was done at the behest of the Ohio governor. I would think the Ohio governor. I, I think I, I, uh, called in the National Guard. I believe. I'd have to research wow. that, but it's it's horrible. So imagine that. Imagine uh, the National Guard 
uh, shooting people on campuses just because they were protesting. Well, according to whatever was on, I guess it was accidental. I mean, you don't shoot somebody accidentally. Well, I mean, four people were yeah, four people were killed. Yeah, yeah, it's it's accidental, but four people were killed. Other than that, though, it was just the National Guard called out because of a protest. Well, one other thing that I have to mention: uh, one of the fellows that I graduated from high school with. Uh, we bumped into him. This was, uh, again, in the early 70s, 71, 72. After it happened, you said it happened in 70? Because I didn't It happened on May 4th, 1970. It happened 54 oh, okay. years ago. I, I was thinking, you know, 71, 72. So yeah, I was four people were uh, killed. That, but anyway. And nine uh, were wounded. Was, nine unarmed yeah. college students were wounded by the Ohio National Guard. Well, there you go. So anyway, the, at, I was at a some sort of a party or group of people. I can't remember exactly what the situation was. But one of the fellows that was there was somebody that graduated from high school with me. He was a professor there at Kent State when that happened. Well, Art Pennard, who used to work here at WNBF, was there when it happened. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, so there you go. Yeah, so we we had spoken with Art Pennard in the past about it. 1148, let's try to get some quick calls. We're getting a lot of action here right at the end of the program. Uh, Martin in Binghamton, good morning. You're on the air. Yeah, uh, Mary Trump was on the program yesterday. Um, Donald's niece and a psychologist and, uh, was also saying about, you know, well, nobody speaks about his age, and how is he going to be in a few years? He'll be 81, 82. <clears throat> um, well, he seems fine now, so I think he's good for another four or five years at least. Yeah, he's real fine right now. Uh, and um, <clears throat> but anyway, she has a lot of insight into Donald's behavior and why why he does it. His father had Alzheimer's, and you know, and you know that runs in families. And um, in her opinion. Well, he was a sociopath. This show Donald no love. Yeah, I don't want people talking about, you know, anybody's opinion about Donald Trump or anyone else. You know, if if they're going to start diagnosing uh, a former president or current president, I think I think that's over the top. Appreciate your call. We're going to try desperately to squeeze in a few more calls. Time, though, is of the essence. We've got more calls coming up on our Wednesday program. Stay tuned. The most calls ever. Vinny from Binghamton, you're on the air. Hey, good morning, Bob. Hey, listen, I want to ask, uh, I think you missed it too, Bob. Tom from Endwell. We heard, I heard you on here talking. I think there's one thing that I really agree with you a thousand percent, actually a million percent, and that is uh, I'm lost because you are lost. Um, Kamala Harris has never said anything about Trump supporters. She has talked about fascists, but she has talked about Donald Trump. And along with Kamala Harris was John Kelly, Mark Motley, Mark uh, Esper, James Mattis, uh, John Bolton, Rex Tillerson, Mike Cohen, the relayer. I, I could write more, but I ran out of ink. And this is what Mike Pence said. Anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. And anyone who asks someone else to put them over the Constitution should never be the president again. All right. Let me, uh, quick, I just got something in from our bureau uh, about what Kamala Harris just said a few minutes ago, and this helps to clarify in case anybody was worried about what you might have heard yesterday from uh, Scranton Joe. You heard my speech last night and continuously throughout my career. Uh, I believe that the work that I do is about representing all the people, whether they support me or not. And as president of the United States, I will be a president for all Americans, whether you vote for me or not. Okay. I think it's clear, except for that noise from that Lockheed Martin helicopter. Gary from the West Side, good morning. I agree when you say, Bob, that people sometimes they don't see January 6th as an insurrection. I also agree with one of your callers that said, you know, that there were cities on flames and stuff like that. And you didn't really notice that and didn't talk about it much. I agree with him. I also agree that Puerto Ricans are not garbage. And I also agree that uh, Trump people are not garbage. Wait a minute, Bob. Bob, I'm not following party lines. What's wrong with me? There must be something wrong with me. I was going to say, I'm, boy, you're, you're really oh, making people confused, buddy. Oh, 
I'm an independent just like you. And that's why you say the things that you do. And the independents are going to win this election. I agree. The independent voters, the non-Republicans and non-Democrats are going to make a difference. And I it's think okay it's important. not to think. It is. It's, it's okay not to think along party yeah, lines. You don't have time. to be, you, be you don't have to wander around in someone's echo chamber, chamber, chamber. Thank you, Gary. That's our program for today. Don't worry. I shall return triumphantly tomorrow from nine to noon on WNBF.